Lecture 34, Ascension, Session and Intercession, Part 2. Before I read you the summary and develop it, may I add one little explanatory note to what I was saying at the end of the last lecture. You may recall I made a, a rapid sort of resume of church history and the way in which the church actually makes its onslaught against the gates of hell and is victorious, and that in that connection I said that much of the church is not the church and much of the attacks is in the name of the church but not the church. I have to explain this. You see, later on when we take up the doctrine of ecclesiology, we will look much more particularly at this. But to avoid any misunderstanding at this earlier stage, let me simply say that we talk about the church visible and the church invisible. And when I talk about the church visible, I mean the church as it is visibly organized in its various denominations, with its ministers and with its members. And uh, some of them, most of them are liberals, that is the world over, a given congregation. They may be much differently distributed, but looking at those who call themselves Christians and Christian churches around the world, the majority of them, members are liberals, and there are a smaller group of evangelicals, and they're divided into two groups, the Arminian evangelical and the Reformed uh, uh, evangelical. But the uh, visible church is made up of those groups. These people do claim. Now, when a given church is so liberal that it actually disavows the Trinity in its creed, it ceases even to be a visible church. But as I've said to you time and again, the liberals usually insist on keeping the terminology. And they will use a baptismal formula in the name of the Trinity even when they don't believe it personally. It'll be just some symbolism to them and not uh, reality. But we can't search the hearts of people. We don't know about whom that is true and not. And so if a church professes to believe in the Trinity and the deity of Christ and to affirm the Apostles' Creed, we consider it a visible uh, church. And we're not denying that even though it be predominantly composed of liberals, that it is a church because these liberals, together with other uh, persons who would be true believers, are nevertheless members of the visible church. They make a profession of the Christian faith and have to be treated as such. I want you to understand that so that when you hear me saying the onslaught against the gates of hell by the Christian church, they're not always the Christian church. I mean by that a minority of those who are in it are actually Christians. Now those who constitute the majority are nevertheless in the visible Christian church. You just have to keep that... Uh, part in mind and not assume that uh, when I say only some of them are Christians that the others aren't Christian churches at all. They could be Christian churches. We have to go by what they say, what they profess to be. If they're Jehovah's Witnesses, of course they're not because they simply reject the deity of Jesus Christ. And we agree that the person of Jesus Christ is so indispensable that if any group calls itself Christian without believing that, it has no right to do so. But as I say, there are others who do make the sound profession, as the Jehovah's Witnesses do not, who are themselves not sound. But the church, nevertheless, would have to be considered a visible Christian church. Number one, Chrysostom, early sense preacher, the golden mouth Chrysostom, one of the great preachers of all time, gives us a beautiful analogy of Christ's work of intercession. This little boy in Constantinople loved his father very much and wanted to give him a present when he returned from a long trip. Mother sent him to the garden to gather a bouquet. He gathered a bouquet of some flowers and assorted weeds. But when father returned, he received a bouquet only of beautiful flowers, attractively arranged because mother had removed all the weeds and sorted all the flowers. Three, the church's prayers prevailing as they are, acceptable as they are, fruitful as they are, are not a thing of beauty as they leave the lips of saints. They are produced partly by the Spirit in the name of the Son and addressed to the Heavenly Father, but as they start their way heavenward, they are a mixed bag, mostly of weeds, 
with a few stray flowers. But when they arrive through the intercession of Christ, the weeds are gone and the flowers are beautiful and beautifully arranged. Four, when we think how inappropriate our prayers are to be addressed to the God of heaven and earth, we simply could not go through with the apparent mockery were Christ not to be counted upon to intercede. He removes all that offends and magnifies our faith, which is smaller than a grain of mustard seed. Five, because we can count on his intercession, we actually have acceptance and boldness before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16. Six, the church has a job to do and no power to do it. But through the intercession, she receives power, Christ's spirit, from on high so that she may witness effectively to the ends of the devil's world, 1 John 5, 19. Seven, we have a heavenly mandate with heavenly power to match. Eight, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. How can the church ever become weary when it is not her power she is using? He ever liveth to make intercession. That analogy of Christ's work in terms of the little boy's gift to his father, you realize that's exactly the situation, don't you? How little love we have for Christ. One of the things that impressed me most was one time when John Murray at the seminary in Philadelphia gave a little message to us students about Christ indicating that one of them would betray him. And you remember their reaction? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Every one of them realized that they were care capable of that monstrous deed. Apparently, they didn't say, Lord, is it he? Lord, is it I? And I always remember John Murray probing the depths of our sinfulness, even as converted persons, so deeply that every one of us at that table that night wondered, too, whether we would betray our Lord. We knew one thing. If he didn't keep us, we would. You see, we have so little love for Christ. We have so little of the presence of the Holy Spirit that if we reflected on the nature of our prayers very deeply, we would be incapable of opening our mouths and God would literally have to twist our arms to get us to make a petition. And we would pray because he has told us to pray without ceasing and assured us he's a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. But certainly we wouldn't come into his presence because we felt we had a right to be called his children and could actually demand his time and could assume that he was concerned with our miserable, largely sinful activities. I'm saying here that if we look at ourselves and realize how little of the grace of God we have, we could hardly pray. We'd be so ashamed of ourselves to come into the presence of the all-holy God and beg the perfect Son to hear our petition in His name. We wouldn't do it. 
I know we talk, you know, rather grandly about how much we love the Lord. Moody was determined to be a fully dedicated person. He hadn't known anyone who had wholly dedicated himself to Christ. I hope Moody never supposed he was a wholly dedicated person. I think he loved the Lord. And I'm sure the Lord used him. But I hope he didn't ever suppose that he reached that goal he was determined to, namely, become a wholly dedicated person. Sometimes we act as if we are, we think we are. We make resolutions to be. That is right. We should be. That's our duty to present our bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to God. I ever tell you about Julia Lake telling her story of dedication, apropos that very phrase, presenting herself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. I always remember that. She had become convinced, as I remember the story, as a girl in the grades or high school, that God wanted her to be a missionary. And furthermore, she felt sure it was China where she was to be a missionary. But she was a young girl, and she was frankly scared of going so far away to such a strange land to become a missionary. But persuaded that Christ wanted her to be a missionary to China, she resolved to be a missionary to China. She dedicated herself to being a missionary to China. She just made one request of God. As she prepared herself for that endeavor, she asked God to send in her, to her life a man whom she could love and who would love her and with whom she would go as a wife and missionary to China. Now that seemed like a reasonable request, but she went all the way through college without meeting that man. And then she enrolled in what was then White's Biblical Seminary in New York, she said. And she finished the first year and hadn't met the answer to her prayers. The second year came and went without the man whom she loved and who loved her, with whom she would be married and go as a missionary to China, and she finished the whole course, was fully trained to be a missionary to China, and God had not seen fit to answer the one petition she had made. As she put it, that day before commencement, I was a very rebellious missionary recruit. And then, all of a sudden, it came over me how sinful I had been all these years in asking God to send a man into my life who would love me and whom I would love and with whom I'd go as a missionary to China. And not that there was anything sinful in wanting to be joined in Christian marriage, but the sinfulness of making that as a kind of condition for her answering what she believed was the will of Christ to be a missionary to China came over her, and then she used this language. Then I took my hands from my life. Now that got to me. As I say, that must have been 40 years ago that I heard her tell that story, but I'd never forget it because I've been at many youth conferences, such as she was speaking to then, and I've heard hundreds and thousands of young people tell about how much Jesus Christ means to them and how completely dedicated to Him they are and what holy resolutions they were making in the implementations of their dedication and so on. But here was the real article. This girl had said that in high school, and she had hung on to it through four years of college and three years of seminary. She had relentlessly pursued the dedicated purpose of becoming a missionary to China, 
This old cynic you are looking at right now would have said, that's dedication. There's the real thing. I had seen a good many of these young people who had said it, who two years later couldn't even remember having said it. But here was a girl who had pursued it for a decade. That was dedication. That was the girl who was saying in her dorm room the night before commencement, the night before she was really launched on her dedicated career, I took my hands from my life. I was saying there was a dedicated girl. That dedicated girl was saying for the first time in my life, I became a dedicated person. For the first time in my life, I really took my hands from my life. I really became a living sacrifice. Now, you don't have real dedication in this world. The best of us have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And I say when we come in the presence of our God, we should be so covered with shame and confusion, we could hardly mumble in his presence, except for the fact that we're made accepted in the beloved. He ever liveth to make intercession for us, utterly unworthy as we are, undedicated as we've proven ourselves to be, meager disciples, followers afar off, not even having enough faith that could be called the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Nevertheless, with boldness, we come into the divine presence to pray. Only one explanation. He removes those weeds. He takes out all that offends, all our unbelief and our slips and our errors and our mistakes and our failures and our lack of confidence and our doubts, all those things, those weeds that dominate our bouquet so completely that you can hardly see a single flower comes by his divine magic as a perfect bouquet of adoration into the presence of a holy God who answers abundantly above anything we ask or think. That's what we're saying in item number three. For when we think how inappropriate our prayers are to be addressed to the Lord of heaven and earth, we simply couldn't go through the apparent mockery were Christ not to be counted on to intercede. He removes all that offends and magnifies our faith, which is smaller than a grustered seed. Five, because we can count on his intercession, we actually have acceptance before the throne of grace, and we are assured of it, and we told that we may come and call him Abba Father, as a matter of fact. Six, the church has a job to do, and she has no power to do it, but through the intercession she receives power, Christ's Spirit, from on high, so that she may witness effectively to the ends of the devil's world. We've got the biggest job any creature ever received. We have been told to make disciples to the ends of the earth. We are to bring this hostile devil's world in subjection to Jesus Christ. Who's equal to these things? But when Christ speaks, as Calvin says, you stand with one foot left, lifted, ready to march. It doesn't make any difference that we're utterly incompetent. We can't do it. He says, do it. That's it. Christ has spoken. You know, Augustine is surely the most quotable theologian who has ever lived. He's probably also, after Paul, the most brilliant theologian who has ever lived. But among his quotable statements, certainly this is one of the choicest of them all, and it belongs here, I think, and it's fulfilled by the very thought we're dealing with now, namely the intercession of Christ. 
He makes these, he makes this immortal statement in his confessions. Lord, I always like to quote it this way, command what you will. Give what you command. Actually, in the confessions, it's the other way around. He first prays, give what you command, then command what you will. See, our tendency is when he lays upon us the responsibility of being perfect, as our Father in heaven is perfect, and when he tells us to bring the world to his feet, our natural reaction is to lapse into apathy and despair. These things are utterly beyond us. Let's see if we can't negotiate, Lord. Let's come to some reasonable terms. Have you forgotten whom you're addressing? Yes, we love you, and we're your servants, but give us a job somewhere within our grasp. You know, he filled out a form here, and uh, what's required for the job that's being done, none of us would actually fit the job description. We're not equal to these things. We can't be perfect. We can't conquer a world. Who do you think we are? And our tendency is to, we don't actually talk that way to God, but we do try to step him down. We think he doesn't mean what he says, or he's saying something other than we had previously interpreted it. Now, Augustine is the true Christian, giving the proper response. And he does it, of course, because he has a wisdom greater than most of us. Let God command what he will, and he does. As I say, we are under a mandate from heaven to be perfect, and we are actually to deliver people out of the kingdom of darkness. That is our job, and there is no way around it. That's our task, and you can't get out of it. You're no more able to escape it than you are competent for it. You see, Augustine feels the same pressure we do. How in the world is he going to be able to meet the demands of God's holiness and so on? But God demands it. All right, we face the fact. One thing we ask of you, Lord. All right, okay, have it your way. Put it on us. One thing we ask. Just give what you command. You command what you please. We're not able. You give what you command. See, I think this is a kind of divine trick. And God has gotten, I mean, Augustine's caught on to it. He commands us something that's utterly beyond our power, precisely that we would ask him to enable us to do what we can do by him, and could never do without him. Without Christ, I could do nothing. But, says the apostle, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. But as I say, I'm a little bit amused that the real text of Augustine, he puts this assurance in even before he lets the Lord command him. Lord, you give what you command and then command it, as long as you will supply me with the ability to meet your demands, assure me of that, then let the command come. Now, you see, this is exactly what our text is assuring us of. He ever lives to make intercession. But don't worry, my friends. Recognize your incompetence. Walk humbly before your God. Acknowledge that I can't do anything, Lord. But at the same time, realize you can do everything because he ever lives to make intercession for you. He is going to do it through you and by you. And because he's working in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure, you are going to work out your own salvation. So humbled as you are in yourself, you are utterly lifted up by himself. You are the vine, and you're the branches in the vine, and the life's 
goes through the vine into the branches which bear the fruit because it is in communion with the vine. We have a heavenly mandate with heavenly power to match, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I mentioned this before. We are triumphant people, and Christianity is a religion of triumphalism, but not by any might or power of her own. We can't do a solitary thing except sin. The only competence we have is to sin, but we can do everything through him who energizes us, and he himself, though he is omnipotent, cannot and will not do anything except by means of us. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How can the church ever become weary when it's not her power she is using? If you ever become tired, my Christian friend, you know what the trouble is. You're relying on your own strength. You thought you were doing the job by your own power. It's no wonder you're exhausted at the mere thought of the task because you don't have any strength. Now, if you ever get tired, it's because you've imagined you had strength and when you tried to lean on it, you found you had none. But on the other hand, how can you become weary when your strength is the strength of the everlasting arm? The Lord God omnipotent reigneth through you, and he ever liveth to make intercession for you. He lets you stumble. He lets you fall. He lets you exhibit your own weakness so you are kept in constant remembrance of your own inability to do what God has commanded you to do, and that will, as I say, by a kind of divine trick, always keep bringing you back to him. He puts a command upon you too much for you. It does reduce you to absolute despair until you remember, ah, I have the strength. It is not in me, but it is in him, and it is going to be put in me and used in me and used through me so that he is going to triumph through the likes of me. He's going to take a little boy's loaves and fishes and feed a multitude. He's going to take us at ramrods and knock down the gates of hell. And hell won't be able to do anything about the likes of us, mind you. Boy, how humiliated the devil's going to be when he sees the like of us taking his goods right out of his hand and him quite unable to stop us because he who is mightier than Satan is in us and by means of ever making intercession for us.